Welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's great to see all of you here in the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. So today, I mean, this, this, this can you hear? Yeah. So uh, this was sent uh, out to you before. So I will be calling on some of the sites. But please, if you have any questions, speak up at any time. You know, it's absolutely no problem. I think that makes it uh, more interactive. Okay, so today we are broadcasting from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, where actually the project originally was born. And uh, here is roughly today's schedule, plus minus, to the extent that we can have schedules. Uh, we have uh, two highlights, guest speakers, Dario Floriano and we have Pascal Kaufmann. Next week, just so that you're aware of this, there will be no lecture. On the 25th of October, exercise three will start instead, so you can start working on that. And the next lecture will be on the 1st of November. At the end of October, there is also, in, uh, in Europe, there is a switch to winter time. So for many of the sites, this will mean that it starts one hour later than it started today. Okay, now, last time I introduced you to the geography of uh, Shanghai, so you can see it here again. And uh, the, you know, well, that's where the Shanghai lecture started. And I think what we can do now, because we're broadcasting from Shanghai, Professor Chen, who is the host of the <coughs> Shanghai lectures, will actually give you a short introduction into uh, Jiao Tong University and uh, his research group. So let me just switch. Okay, so now uh, the, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening at the Global Lecture lecture Hall, everybody in the Global Lecture Hall. Um, I'm very happy to have to have the opportunity to host uh, Professor Rolf Pfeffer in Shanghai again. And uh, I will really take this opportunity to introduce uh, our uh, university, our school, and the, our life to you briefly. How to switch to yes. yes. Okay. And the Shanghai uh, University, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, is located in Shanghai. Uh, as you know, Shanghai is the big city in China, uh, located in the in the in the uh, the as we develop the Shanghai position as a as a gate of the Shanghai of the China uh, Eastern uh, Sea Line. And uh, our unity has uh, 20, uh, 24 schools, and we have about uh, 3,000 faculty members and about uh, 40,000 uh, students, including about 2,000 uh, 2, foreign students. And, the student, and our university is uh, famous for the uh, uh, science and uh, te uh, technology education and research, also in the uh, medicine research and education. And uh, the School of Electronic Information and Elect Electrical Engineering is the biggest one, big school uh, in our uh, university. And we have five departments. Yeah, yes. And the, the, the the Department of uh, Electric Engineering, the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and the, the Department of 
electrical engineering and the department of uh, instrument science and engineering and the department of automation and uh, we are our uh, lab the autonomous robot lab belongs to the department of automation the department of, of automation is the oldest uh, uh, department of automation in china and we have uh, uh, six, uh, more than six, 60 affected members, including uh, uh, more, uh, more than 24, uh, more than 20 uh, professors, and uh, also uh, uh, three, uh, 36 associate professors. And the, in the department, we have four in, uh, research institute, institutes. One is the Institute of Complex System and the Control Theory, and the Institute of Robotics and Intelligent Inform, uh, Information Processing, and the Institute of, of Advanced Control and Automation, and the Institute of Image Processing and the Pattern Recognition. So we do a lot of research work and the development uh, and the, uh, in the automation sense and the engineering. And our uh, lab, the autonomous robot lab, belongs to the uh, automation uh, department. Our research uh, is, is focusing on the mobile robotics and the multi-robotics. And uh, we integrated the, some uh, uh, technology of mobile robotics and the multi-robotics to the service robotics. We, we are now developing different kind of service robotics, service robots, for example, the intelligent wheelchair and the, the uh, uh, in, intelligent robotic arm to help the, the disabled and the, the elderly. And this is the, 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 the whole view of uh, our assistive robotics Robot, robots for the disabled and the, uh, the elderly. And we developed the, the, the different kind of uh, assistive robots, including an internal wheelchair, working assistant robot, and assistive robot arm, and integrated the different kind of robot into a networking system. And the, the system can help the, the elderly and the disabled in their daily life. And the, our lab also have a, a broad uh, co collaboration with the industry, uh, with the domestic industry and the international uh, industry to develop the uh, uh, robotic technology uh, for, deep, uh, for the uh, application in uh, auto, uh, manufacturing automation and uh, electric power automation, and also we collaborate with some uh, international industry uh, in the uh, engineering education and the robotic education area. So that's all, and uh, I thank you for your attention, and uh, I really hope the success uh, of Shanghai Lecture. Thank you. for this uh, introduction. So now uh, you basically know where we are, from where we're uh, broadcasting. So I'm going to switch back here. Also, we are going to have a highlight, which is the guest speaker, uh, Professor Dario Floriano who will talk about bio-inspired flying robots. And then we have uh, Pascal Kaufmann, who will talk about the Roboy project, about these robots that you see on the right here. OK, now lecture four, dedicated to design principles for intelligent systems. OK, these are today's topic. Let me just start from uh, 
Let me start from a short recap. Oh, I should mention actually, one of the students from uh, Korea, from uh, um, ISRC, at the Sung Kong Kwan University in Seoul, mentioned in the blog, uh, sort of objecting to the idea that, uh, you know, the symbol processing paradigm cannot deal with real world situations. And he was discussing IBM's uh, Watson program. I'm sure you've all heard about IBM's Watson program. They can play this, you know, game Jeopardy, which is about sort of simple, simple questions from all over the place. And I was wondering whether we could have a short presentation and discussion, not next week, it shouldn't say next week, but in two weeks on the 1st of November. Would that be okay for uh, ISRC? Just like, you know, a five-minute, uh, seven-minute uh, comment on this issue? I think this is of interest to everyone. Would that be okay? Yeah. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Um, yes, we can discuss it. I can prepare some presentation about Watson program, and then we can discuss it next week. I think that would be great. Yeah, you can sort of yeah, okay. state your criticism and you know what you think about it, and maybe the others can also start thinking about this, so that we have an interesting discussion then next week. Okay, well, but yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for your uh, contribution. Okay, now the recap. So we introduce these uh, complete agents. Now, what are complete agents? Well, we realized that they, you know, remember this fungus eater metaphor. So these are basically the fungus eaters. They are sent to a distant planet. So you can no longer, and they have to collect uranium ore. You know, that was in the 1960s. This was a good thing. Now people don't like that so much anymore. But if if the agent has to collect ore physically, obviously it has to be embodied. Right, let's see, embodied. I think this is something that you should all know and remember. And because it's so far away, it can no longer be remote controlled. Nobody there to change the batteries and do repair work, so they have to be autonomous and self-sufficient. That is, they have to be able to e sustain themselves over extended periods of time. Self-sufficient, and the last one would be, they have to be situated, which means that they have to be able to learn about the environment through their own sensory systems as they interact with the environment because there is nobody this cannot be programmed we don't know everything about the planets so they have to be they have to be situated okay i mean so far so good now let's look at the properties of Im embodied agents so properties of embodied agents i mean because they're embodied because they're embodied, they are subject to laws of physics, of course, right? If you have an algorithm, software, it's not subject to the laws of physics, really. I mean, there's no weight. You can't say how heavy an algorithm is, right? But you can say how heavy a robot is. And then we have a very important point that whenever you move in the environment, you generate, generate patterns of sensory stimulation. I just say patterns. Well, important, of sensory stimulation. That's very important. You know, you can feel the pressure on your feet. The environment travels across your visual field. You can touch something. You can sense it with your tactile sensors. That's because you're interacting with the environment. And then, of course, because you're, you're moving, you're acting, you also affect the environment. Right? I'm, when I'm talking, I'm putting pressure waves into the air. When I walk across the grass, I crush the grass under my foot. So I affect the environment. 
then because agents, physical agents or physical systems, they are complex dynamical systems, And let's see, maybe we can have uh, shortly, you know, we talk about complex dynamical systems. And uh, there typically we also talk about nonlinear, uh, nonlinear systems. Uh, let me let me see. Let me just go back one slide. And they perform morphological computation. I come back to that. But let's briefly talk about this idea of uh, nonlinear uh, complex uh, systems. So maybe we can briefly switch to Budapest for a short comment. I mean, in nature, in nature, most interesting systems are actually nonlinear systems, right? Now, what are nonlinear systems in contrast to linear systems? Maybe you can briefly comment on this issue. What are the main characteristics of nonlinear systems compared to linear systems? You want to uh, comment? We can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you. Ah, yeah, now it's good. Um, ah, no, no, we can't. It was better before. Now. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe we can. Uh, it, it seems that the connection dropped. Uh, okay. Okay. So well. So maybe we can we can uh, switch switch uh, to uh, Budapest later on. So we talk about dynamical systems, complex systems, nonlinear systems, chaos theory. Uh, Uh, chaos, uh, chaos theory, we have something which is called the phase space. Right now the phase space is, uh, or are you ready now in, uh, in Budapest? Uh, Budapest, you almost cannot hear you. I can't hear you. No. Okay, I think we'll, we we have to we have to uh, I think we have to continue here and uh, we'll do something later. Okay. So now we have something which is called the phase space. So what you're you have to choose some variables that you consider important. Now maybe I can ask the local audience here in Shanghai if you take a robot, a quadruped robot, robot with four legs, what could be a sensible phase space? for a robot like that. You know, uh, important variables that describe the state of the system. So when you have legs, yeah. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. You want to go ahead? Yeah, no. Okay. Huh? Okay. Oh, huh? Okay. An example would be, of course, when you have a, a let's say, joint. When you have a robot, let's say a quadruped robot, you have joints, right? You have maybe shoulder joints, hip joints. You have knee joints. So maybe you have, let's say, you have eight joints on the robot, so you can choose the eight joint angles as the important variables that characterize the state of your system. 
Okay? And then, you know, the nonlinear system, which I was going to ask the, the people in Budapest, we have, uh, I think what's, what's really important about nonlinear systems is the limited predictability. And you have what's called the uh, sensitivity to uh, initial conditions, which means that if the initial conditions even change very slightly, after a very short period of time, the systems will go in a completely different direction. And if you take something like the weather, the weather is a typical nonlinear system. And so you just have a slight change in the initial conditions, you know, then the, the forecast or the weather may differ very much from the forecast, which is why weather forecasts always, most of the time, you know, or at least uh, highly un, uh, unreliable. And then there is an important property also, which is of, of non, uh, non linear systems, is that you cannot superpose two solutions. You cannot superpose two solutions. For example, when you think about your favorite song, right? You like to listen to your favorite song. And then you have another favorite song, so your two favorite songs. If you play the two favorite songs simultaneously, you don't get double pleasure, right? So it's not linear in the sense that you cannot just linearly add the uh, uh, systems. Okay, a further point is that we have what, what we call trajectories. And a trajectory is just how a point travels through phase space. So one point in phase space characterizes the entire state of the system. So with the eight joints, the quadruped robot with the eight joints, eight dimensional space. So each point characterizes the eight joint angles. And then the trajectory is the how this point moves through the uh, phase space. And then we have attractor states. And attractor states are those states to which the system will automatically move if it is in within a certain region in phase space, which is called the basin of attraction. And there are different types. There are different types of attractor states. There are different types of attractor states. There are point attractors. That's when the joints, you know, stabilize, but there are also periodic attractors, especially in walking, in running, periodic movement. They return to a similar location, to the same location. And then you have what's called, so these are called periodic attractors or quasi-periodic attractors because it's never exactly the same. And then you have chaotic attractors where the, the trajectory remains within a uh, certain region in a phase space, but in there it's unpredictable. Okay? I mean, these basic concepts you can read, you can read in, uh, in the book, and I think you should familiarize yourself with these concepts. Complex dynamical systems, I think we will, are going to need that throughout the class. I think it's a very powerful metaphor. Okay? Now, the main topic of today's lecture is design principles for intelligent systems. And we're going to look at a few of these principles and we're going to finish the set of principles next, next week. Okay. Let's start with the first one, the three constituent principle. Three constituent principle. So when we design a robot, we not only design the robot, but we have to understand the ecological niche, which is the environment in which the robot behaves, moves, has to function. Then we have to define the desired behaviors and tasks. What should the robot be able to do? And then we can design the uh, agent itself. And we always have to simultaneously think of all three of them. And these are sort of different design stances. You can say, for example, okay, 
I have a, an ecological niche which could be, uh, let's say, a home, you know, Professor Chen was mentioning robots for the elderly, which could be a home for the elderly. And then we say, what should this robot be able to do? That's kind of the standard thing. We say, well, it should clean, you know, it should be able to do the dishes, it should be able to remind the elderly to take their medicine, it should, you know, advise on entertainment and so on. And then you design the agent itself. That's one design stance. But you can also say, well, I already have a robot and I have the, the behaviors and the tasks that it can do. In which environments, which kinds of environments is it going to be useful? Right? So that's typically the salesperson's perspective. You know, he or she has a robot and <laughs> knows what the robot can do and then looks for places where this robot could function usefully. Alternatively, you, you can, for example, if you think about these three together, then often a very small modification of your environment, you know, putting some marks in the environment can dramatically simplify the design of the agent. So you should always think about designing the agent together with the environment and often small modifications to the environment dramatically simplify the task. This is also uh, a, um, an activity called scaffolding. So I'm putting a scaffold in the environment or what we had last time, you can put road signs into the streets and then you can forget about your geography, you just follow the road signs. So a simple m manipulation, a simple change in the environment can greatly simplify uh, your tasks. Okay, that was one principle. Let me give you another one, the complete agent principle. So you should always think about the complete agent behaving in the real world. Isolated solutions often create artifacts, like um, in uh, computer vision. Uh, in some areas of computer vision, people analyze static images, photographic images. Now, I, actually, when I was here in uh, 2009, a, a computer vision student came to my office and said, well, uh, actually, a very clever student, and she said, you know, she sort of asked me about, you know, what, what we're doing. I explained, uh, you know, the approach, and then she said, well, that's very interesting, but you're not solving the partial occlusion problem. So what's the partial occlusion problem? You know, when I, uh, I have this, uh, this bottle here, now I put this bottle behind the computer, like this, then from my point of view, it's partially occluded. You can see it, but now from your point of view, it's partially occluded. You, can't, you, know, you can see only part of it, but you can still recognize the bottle, right? You can still recognize the bottle. So that's the partial occlusion problem. And then I said, yeah, that's true. I'm indeed not solving the partial occlusion problem. But maybe because I have an agent that is mobile and can move around in the real world, you know, I can just move around to the side and then I can see the object completely. As you can see now, you can see the object completely. I can also move it and then I can recognize it without having to solve the partial occlusion problem. So maybe the partial occlusion problem often is an artifact of the fact that you have a static image, but once you have a complete agent that can move around, maybe you don't need to solve that. There is another issue, uh, and that is that in a biological system, every action has potentially an effect on the entire system. In industrial applications, you have very good robots and their engineers try to keep the individual parts as much independent from other parts as possible. But in biological systems, you know, I lift my arm, then the weight distribution in my body changes. So everything is affected. But this can also be exploited. Let me give you an example here. So here you have a cluttered environment, 
you know, with apples, a table with apples, and, uh, with fruit, you know, bananas. And here you have a robot. Here you have the situation. Now, this robot can only see things that move. Many insects can only see things that move. If nothing moves, and if they themselves don't move, they can't see anything. And so, what, but what this robot can do, it can, with the finger, poke into the... Uh, with the finger it can poke onto the table and then if it happens to hit for example this apple now this apple moves because the agent is interacting with the environment and then it can see it so it can make it move and then it can see it that's because it's a complete uh, agent and the manipulation of the environment the poking can facilitate perception okay i think these uh, these uh, principles are pretty obvious, but keep them, do keep them in mind. Now, let me come to a slightly more complicated one, the principle of parallel loosely coupled processes. Okay, so what does it say? It states that intelligent behavior is emergent from system environment interaction. It's based on a large number of parallel loosely coupled processes that are asynchronous, largely asynchronous, and they are coupled through the agent sensory motor system and the environment. Let me give you examples of this. So there is a historic uh, paper that uh, was basically about the embodied turn by Rodney Brooks. So remember last time we made the evolutionary argument about insects. It's the same Rodney Brooks who said, you know, getting from zero from the primordial soup to insects was much harder than getting from insects to human beings. And he, in the 1980s, wrote a paper about the uh, subsumption architecture. The paper had a very, uh, let's say, innocuous title called A Robust Layered Control System for a Mobile Robot. Now, it was, in principle, a criticism of the classical cognitivistic paradigm here, which is perception, you know, like modeling, planning, acting. That's what most people in robots, in robotics do. It's also called the sense, model, plan, act philosophy. It's the cognitivistic paradigm, or sense, sometimes it's called sense, think, act cycle. Now, so f basically, first you have perception. Then, you know, you have some kind of modeling. You're tr trying to recover the properties of the environment, reconstruct the environment. You have an act of planning, and then you act. Right. So it's basically this sequential sort of thing. Now, he argued that if you have to function in the real world, it's not going to work like that. You have to have parallel processes directly from perception or from sensors to actuators. So there would be a process, move forward, one, avoid obstacles, then collect object and explore the environment, for example. And this each process can, you know, get sensory input and can influence directly the actuators. And what's happening in here is relatively simple. This is what's called a behavior-based architecture or a subsumption architecture. And then he said, he built this famous robot, uh, six-legged robot, Genghis, which was suited, which was actually equipped with the, with the uh, subsumption architecture. And of course it's well suited because all these legs have to function in parallel, right? I cannot just move one leg and then I move the next leg and then I move the next leg. They have to function in parallel. Otherwise, the insect wouldn't get anywhere. Now the question is, how do you coordinate the legs in walking? Now, Hulk Cruz is a German biologist, and it has been known for a while that there is no central control for leg coordination. So there is only local communication between neighboring legs. So, for example, here is a schematic representation of the neural system. So here you have a leg and here you have a group of neurons and they are there to control the movements of the legs. So for example, you know, like this. They just move the legs like this. 
And there's no central control, but they are connected to each other. This is connected to this one, this is connected to this one, and so on. Now, how is it possible that these insects can coordinate their leg movements in walking even though there is no central brain that's controlling the legs? Well, there actually is global communication be, uh, between the legs, but it's not through the nervous system, or not so much through the nervous system, but it's through the interaction with the environment. Okay, now how does that work? Imagine that the insect is standing on the ground, and then it pushes back with one of its legs. Now what happens with the other legs? with the joints in the other legs. They're also moved, right? Because I have you no know, complete agent, I have a complete physical system. So through the physical system, and because it's standing on the ground, there's gravity. If you move one leg, all the other joints in the other legs that are standing on the ground are also moved, right? And so all you need is, for example, joint angle sensors, and then you have global communication between the legs. So here the idea is, uh, we have joint angle sensors. Now, if the insect is uh, pushing back with one, let's say, with this leg, then all the others are being pushed forward, right? And you can imagine that then the joint angles change. That's because it's an embodied physical system. And then if I have the joint angle sensors, I can measure the effect of this movement on the sensory system. And I can exploit this information for coordinated walking. So I think this is a really interesting way. And so, so what you have here, I think this is an example for the principle of parallel loosely coupled processes. And what you have here is a coordination of the legs through the interaction with the environment, not so much through the neural system, but through the interaction with the environment. I think it's very important, a uh, very important uh, principle to keep in mind that processes can often be coordinated through the interaction with the environment. That's also why they're called sometimes weakly, weakly coupled processes, parallel or loosely coupled processes. Now, the question is, and the question has been asked, well, this may be okay for as an engineering principle, but it's also of interest for cognitive science. That is, does it provide explanations for biological systems? Okay. I think Brooks, Rodney Brooks made, made a strong point that it's not a, that it is an engineering principle, a powerful engineering principle, but that it's also an explan for also provides explanations for biological systems, also for complex biological systems. So let's uh, let's look at the an example of this, an instantiation of this. So we have the social interaction robot Kismet that was built a while ago at the MIT. Uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory by Cynthia Brazil, who is now at the Media Lab. This is a famous robot called Kismet, and uh, it's, it was developed for social interaction. So, not done, can we have the uh, Kismet video here? I like you, Kismet. You're a pretty funny person. Now, that's a... Do you laugh at all? I laugh a lot. Carol says I laugh a lot. I try not to laugh at her. <laughs> okay. You're adorable. Who are you? What are you? Mm -hmm. I want to show you something. This is, this is a watch that my this is a watch that my girlfriend gave me. Yeah, look, it's got a little blue light in it, too. You're like, I almost lost it this week. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, Don, I think that's... Uh, how, how are you? That's, you know what it's like that's fine. Okay. So, 
So you, you've seen the uh, interaction, and actually this guy was going on for like half an hour, you know, interacting with a robot like that. He thought it was very interesting. Now, this is again an instantiation, an example of the principle of loosely, parallel loosely coupled processes. So imagine that you have a reflex turning towards a loud noise. You know, there's a loud noise, you turn your head. I mean, that's just a, an inborn reflex. Or turn towards a moving, a fast moving object. Another one is, another reflex is follow slowly moving objects. So if I, you know, walk across here, I can't walk across because I have to stay in front of the camera. If I walk across here, the auditorium, you are going to follow me with your eyes, but not because you want to follow me, but because it's a reflex. So that's another reflex. Then there is a habituation reflex, which means that if you have been doing something for a while, you get bored and you want to do something else. Okay. Now imagine that someone comes into the door, as we've seen a couple of times now during the lecture, there is a loud noise from the door, you turn your head. Then the person walks into the room, slow movement, you follow the person with, uh, with your eyes, and then assuming that you're talking to someone, then habituation is no longer interesting, the other person starts talking again, you turn your head towards the other person. Right? This is exactly the behavior you would expect from a socially competent person. Right? So, can we say that social competence is maybe a collection of reflexes. And mind, mind you, these reflexes are coordinated through the interaction with the environment. They don't need to be coordinated internally. It's okay just to have the in environmental uh, input. So now uh, I would like to briefly switch to Moscow for a short reaction on this hypothesis social competence as a collection of reflexes. Can we switch to Moscow? Ah, here you are. Okay. You want to react to this uh, statement? We can't hear you at the moment. Oh, we have to switch to... Okay. okay. Can okay. you say? Would you like to say something? Uh, social confidence as a collection of reflexes which uh, have been acquired through cooperation or coordination with the environment. I think it's absolutely correct and uh, it's not only through neural system that we are processing um, information but also through interaction with the environment and uh, it's only natural, we support it completely and uh, now one of the new theories in cognitive linguistics is called, uh, you know, social cognition. And uh, okay. it's based on interaction uh, with uh, the environment and interaction in communication. And we are now talking about languaging as a type of activity, as action. You see, everything is now based on action and interaction. So I'm a cognitive linguist. I can only just support this uh, hypothesis. And I know that linguists prove it's true. It's really so. So that's my reaction. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, you know, many people... Uh, I uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't agree with you, or, but um, uh, thank you for, the, for your uh, statement, I guess, from a you know, very competent uh, person. There is also an interesting paper by an American psychologist with uh, the telling title on the, um, uh, what is it called, the unbearable automaticity of being, you know, which of course is an allusion to Milan Kundera's book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, but he also argues that much more of our behavior than we would like to believe is actually driven by reflexes. But once you think about it, it's actually a good thing because then you don't have to worry about that. It takes care of itself automatically and you can worry about more important things. So what at first sight seems something like a threat as uh, on second side, actually something extremely useful. Okay, now back to this uh, uh, scaling issue, the Brooks-Kirsch the Brooks debate. So Brooks said, 
Well, once we understand insects, you know, earwigs as a type of insect, we will also understand humans. And Kirsch, you know, said, well, today the earwig, uh, tomorrow man. So he argued that basically the subsumption architecture or simple architectures like that will not be sufficient to explain uh, human behavior. So the question is a bit that I would like to discuss here or that we will discuss in the next lecture in uh, two weeks is uh, to what extent will principles like the subsumption architecture also apply to very complex biological systems like human beings and uh, the volunteer, we, I think we've already found a volunteer, right Christopher? So we will have uh, from Hobart in Australia, we will have a uh, presentation in two weeks time on the Brooks curse debate or the scalability issue, let's put it this way, right? Okay. So let's uh, skip the topic for now and move on to the uh, next topic that I would like to discuss with you. And it's a case study on uh, Puppy. Puppy as a complex dynamical system. You know, we said agents, autonomous agents are physical systems. And let's look at running. Running is a really hard problem because the neural system is relatively slow. How can it deal with fast processes such as running? You know, you have impact, you have uh, you know, uh, oscillations in knee, knee joints, and what you can do is you can actually outsource some of the functionality to the morphological and material properties of the system, which is called morphological computation. So let's look at this. So uh, last week, remember last week, we talked about emergence of behavior. Why emergence of behavior? Why emergence of behavior? Let me see. Yeah. Why emergence of behavior? Because if you look at the control program, you just have the oscillation of the legs. We have springs in here. Oh, you can see it on the next slide. So we have springs here, attached here. This joint and this joint are passive. And only this joint is actually moved back and forth. Right. So by just looking at this oscillation in the control program, you can't say how the system behaves. You have to know what these material properties are, what the shape of this uh, is. And so in, in a sense, the functionality of stabilization and coping with impact is outsourced to morphological and material properties. So can we have uh, the video of Poppy on a treadmill so you can see? Yeah, I'm so sorry. No. No, it's recording. Ah, yeah, good. Okay, yeah, that's good. Sometimes it goes back. Uh, uh, now then, can we have the slow motion? Now you can see the slow motion. You can see exactly what's happening on the treadmill. Yeah, this is very good. You can see it's very irregular, the movement, but it always comes back into its, uh, into its gait pattern. So this is, again, a self-stabilizing system. And as long as it's within a basin of attraction, remember we talked about attractors, it will go back into its attractor state, but not because of control from the brain, but because of the construction of the mechanical system and the, you know, the spring-like system and uh, the, the, way it's, uh, the way it's actuated. So again, you know, we don't have sensors, we don't have control, we have a self-stabilizing system. This is also an illustration of a principle that we call the principle of cheap design that I will talk about more later on. Now, if we look at this, uh, if uh, we look at this graph, you know, we can say, okay, we have the mechanical system that's basically the agent plus we have the sensory system and then we have the controller and we have the environment. And now when we look at Puppy, maybe we can briefly uh, have a, an answer from Zurich, from the students in Zurich. What part of the diagram 
is relevant or what parts of the diagram are relevant to the movement of puppy, to the explanation of the movement of puppy. Maybe we can switch to Zurich. Yeah, okay, anyone uh, would like to venture a uh, hypothesis? Okay. No? Nobody? Okay, no problem. So if we look at this diagram, then we see... There's somebody. For Oh, there's someone? Ah, okay, go ahead. So as you said before, the, the um, mechanical system um, yep. performs, here. performs morphological computation. Um, although I'm not sure if it's computation at all, but, but you said it's computation. And it's made of, of springs and, and, um, and joints. Yep. And I think the mechanical system um, uh, causes part of the behavior, namely the behavior that isn't controlled by, by the kind of nervous system. Okay, right. And so basically we, we definitely have this part. Uh, the controller, I mean, there's is, is a bit of, I would say there is a bit of, let's see if I can, if I can uh, write here. No, I don't have the pen. So there's a bit of control, but it's just, it doesn't have sensors, so we don't have this part. This part doesn't exist. We have this part, we have the mechanical feedback, which is responsible for the stabilization. So we actually have this part of the diagram, which is relevant, and we do not have uh, the uh, sensory system. Okay, well, thank you for your uh, reply from Zurich. And let's now look at the principle of cheap design. So the principle of cheap design is roughly speaking about what we call exploitation of the ecological niche and the, of the interaction with the environment. Remember the Swiss robots, right? The Swiss robots. There, the, the Swiss robots, you know, they did the clustering of the styrofoam cubes and they were exploiting, of course, without knowing, but they were exploiting the conditions in the environment. For example, what were some of the conditions? Maybe we can have the local audience here in uh, Shanghai again. What were some of the conditions that they were uh, exploiting? Yeah, want to go ahead? What were some of the conditions that they were exploited? You know, for example, it was an arena, so there were walls around the arena, right? The environment. And then there were was, was like, yeah? Not sure. We are not sure. Ah, okay, no problem. So. They're the weight of the styrofoam cubes. The styrofoam cubes are very light, so they can be pushed by the robots. If they were, you know, heavy lead or metal, you know, they could be pushed. And uh, you know, the properties properties of the ground, the positioning of the sensors, the size. These conditions all had to hold, and then the robots could function very cheaply, very very naturally. Also, there is a principle uh, called the parsimony principle that we want to find the cheapest, uh, the, the simplest possible solution for a given set of tasks. Okay. Now let's look at an example of a human, or of just walking, not only human walking, but uh, wo robot walking. Here, you know, passive dynamic walker. Okay. So we have an uh, an extremely simple case here called the passive dynamic walker. Not done, can we have the video of the passive dynamic walker? Ah, here we go. So this thing, this creature works on an incline. So it's at a certain angle. 
It has no sensors, it has no motors, it has no microprocessors. It's just a passive mechanical structure. That's why it's called the passive dynamic walker. It's a completely brainless robot, but it walks in a very stable way down the incline. You know, if you change the angle of the incline, it doesn't work anymore. It cannot work on flat ground because it needs energy, right? So this is walking without control, so to speak. Now again, uh, maybe someone here, a uh, uh, local audience, can tell me something about the parts of the diagram that are relevant for the passive dynamic walker. Maybe you can argue. Okay, I think uh, I think the mechanical system and the tactile environment is relevant to the uh, to the passive walker. Right. Find the other uh, parts. Why? Um, because the walker has no sensor and no central nervous system or even no motor. Exactly. So, uh, so if it, it works because of the uh, interaction with the environment passively. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So that's exactly the point. And uh, we only basically deal with this part I have a, uh, I, now I have a short question about uh, the, ah, I think I made a mistake here, uh, uh, the, uh, I made, I made a mistake here just a second, uh, right, so, where is the memory for walking? Maybe I can ask this question to the global audience. So would anyone want to answer the question, where the memory is? Where is the stability for walking stored in the passive dynamic walker? Where is the stability stored? Uh, I, uh, uh, I think um, the walker has no memory, and he can, can't memorize what or the walk and but it works just because of the gravity, and okay. uh, we can call it embodied, embodied. Okay. Okay. So you can either say well, there is no memory, depends on what kind of notion of memory you have, but oh. the ability of walking is somewhere, right? It has to be somewhere. Um, and as you say, it's in the body. Mm. You know, it's, it's the ability for walking is actually in but distributed. Oh, the memory of the walker exactly in the body. It's, it's in the body. It's in the body. In the it's incorporated body. into the physical structure of yeah. the system. Yeah. And so this also teaches us that, that um, memory is maybe not something where you, you know, put something and then you retrieve it, but maybe it's distributed throughout the entire organism. I mean, this thing will always walk. It will have the ability to walk. Now, yeah, thank you for your uh, uh, reply. Now, the team of Andy Reen University said, okay, let's extend. Now, see, one big disadvantage of the passive dynamic walker is that uh, it can only walk on inclines at a certain angle. Now, Andy Arena said, okay, let's have it walk on a, on a flat ground, level ground. So he added a contact sensor. Whenever the contact sensor is triggered, the other legs are brought forward. And uh, maybe uh, not done, can we have the uh, video of the Cornell Ranger? Yeah, cool. Right, I mean, it's a funny robot, you know, but what's interesting, what's interesting about it is that, you know, we call, again, you know, what we call exploitation of passive dynamics is that on one single battery charge, which is, by the way, on the robot itself, it can walk 65 kilometers, 
65 kilometers on one battery charge. Nobody would have thought this to be possible. I think it's an extremely ingenious uh, design. So we talk about control of locomotion by exploitation of passive dynamics. That's the jargon that we use here. And here we have a, just a bit of sensing, tiny bit of sensing, a bit of control, and uh, again, the mechanical system and the feedback from the mechanical system. By contrast, this is a fully controlled system, no exploitation of passive dynamics, everything controlled. Okay? Can we have the video of Curio as an example of a robot where everything is controlled? Ah, here we go. Okay, so you can see this typical robot-like walking. I mean, it's cute, but it's not very natural, not a very natural kind of movement, right? Okay, so much now for uh, the principle of cheap design, exploitation of passive dynamics, exploitation of conditions in the environment. Let me now come to the last principle that I want to discuss with you today. We have about maybe five minutes left. Um, the redundancy principle. Now maybe we can briefly switch to Osaka and you can uh, give us some examples or explain what we mean by redundancy and give us some examples. Yeah, how about some examples of uh, redundancy? or just give us an idea of what we mean by redundancy. Uh, in engineering, uh, redundancy is a, a duplication of critical components or a function of a system with an intention of increasing uh, reliability of the system, uh, usually in the case of b uh, backup or file safe. Okay, very good. So I think that's what we normally think about uh, redundancy. We, we will see that in order to explain biological systems, we have to slightly change the uh, definition. Can we have some examples maybe from Chiba of redundancy? Can you give us a couple of examples? Where Hello. do we have redundancy? Uh, redundancy is found in aircraft engineering. Aircraft has many engines, computers, and braking system. The braking system consists of two or three parts, the wheels, the jet, and the parachute. More than one pilot rides on the board. Also, redundancy is found in human body. A human body has two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, two arms, two legs, etc. Uh, thank you. Okay, I think these are all very good examples of uh, redundancy. Uh, when you say, for example, the human has two eyes, now this is not an exact duplication of components, right? because with the two eyes we see the environment from a different perspective. So in biological systems we have an overlap of functionality but we never have entire uh, duplication. By the way, another, another system which is very redundant is the natural language system. So language is a highly redundant system and this is why we can communicate so well in spite of the fact that normally in everyday conversation there's a lot of noise around, people rarely make grammatically correct sentences, and even if you don't understand individual words, you still understand what the person is saying. So language is a highly redundant system as well. Okay, now let's look at this uh, 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 redundancy principle. So the, uh, the idea is that in the redundancy principle, we have uh, like was mentioned for aircraft, we have braking systems. If you look at the braking system, you have the wheels and you also have the jets, right? Now, 
for example, normally aircraft will brake with the wheels on the runway. Now, if there is ice on the runway, then the brakes through the wheels will not be very efficient, but then they use the jets because the jets don't care whether there is ice on the runway or not. Now, mind you, we are exploiting a different physical process for the braking in the two cases. That makes the system much more adaptive. Just having additional wheels will not help if there is ice on the runway. But you need a different physical process. Or if you take ice, you take two eyes. If you add an additional 98 eyes so that you have 100 eyes, if it gets dark, completely dark, the additional 98 eyes are not going to be very useful to you, right? But if you have a haptic system, a touch system, with which you can feel in the environment, mechanical touch, not electromagnetic waves, but mechanical touch, you can still function, maybe not as well, but you can still function. That's the biological redundancy principle, okay? Oh, actually, I, I actually have another one that I uh, wanted to uh, explain, but maybe we have to postpone. Not done. Uh, would we have a couple of minutes, or should we... Uh, the thing is, you also have uh -huh. the presentation from Sian. You shouldn't okay. forget that. Okay. Let me do the following then. I will stop here with my presentation, and I will do that uh, in two weeks' time, or maybe you can read about this. And uh, then uh, we finish today with the presentation from Xi'an. Okay? Shall we do it like that? Uh, and then okay, we let's switch do that. to our I'll guest speaker. Switch to Xi'an, and maybe Rolf could uh, then stop the screen sharing, and Xi'an can take over. Absolutely. We'll do so. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Dustin. I think you can uh, you can start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can so. Can you start sharing your screen? Uh, okay, share my screen right now. We are connecting now. You think you can start the uh, screen sharing? I mean, the, the you think it's going to work? I mean, the other possibility is that we. We can also uh, we could otherwise we can do it in two weeks time, huh? Maybe now then, maybe maybe we have to do it in uh, in two weeks. We have to postpone it. No, I think they're they're sharing now, so we should be able to see the presentation in a moment. There we go. Okay. Oh, it says. But it. Uh huh. Okay. 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 There we go. Hello, oh, okay. Can you hear me clearly? Okay, now it's okay. Okay. It was okay. Hello, come to Thank you. Um, today my topic is 
the pause and cancel of chance room experiment. Okay, now let's back a little, let's back up a little bit to get some background information. In 1950, Alan Turing devised his Turing test in his paper to define intelligence, and he thought if a machine could pass the Turing test, then this machine could be called intelligent. As early as 1980, John Roger Sale described two schools of thought concerning AI systems. Weak AI, where AI systems are merely simulations of human mind, and the strong AI, where an AI system that can perfectly simulate the human mind, that and it can be defined as a equivalent to a human mind. By this definition, a strong AI would also need to possess understanding and other cognitive states of including consciousness and intentionality. John Rogers Zell, the pro, um, philosopher and the philosopher professor of philosophy at the University of California, Berkeley, brought up the chance room experiment to oppose the view of John AI. He brought up two cases to illustrate his views. Case one, so who only speak English ran the program instructions written by English and in a room in with only one entrance and one exit. Then we send the English stories and issues. We also can only give English answer, yes or no. Through operating. Case two, the room can handle chance input and provide chance output, which only needs adding some English instructions for so to follow. So believes that um, his performance in both cases are equally impressive and can pass the Turing test, but the former knows the problems, the latter does not. So this experiment soon suffered rebuttals, but so gives his own responses. The first comes is about the system response. So does not understand Chinese, or, um, and, but the whole room system can understand. This is just like so can understand all kinds of English stories, but his single brain cell cannot understand any story. So understanding is the function of all the of the entire system rather than the function of some certain parts. So respond that chance room can make all the functions beyond so into so, such as making so remember all program instructions. So you can forget about the room. So it can receive chance input and give chance, chance output in the open air, but it still doesn't understand Chinese too. Some strong air views waters think that. So understanding English means understanding in general way, means presenting results of program operations. But to so, these two kinds of understanding have, have essential distinctions. The former knows that A means B, but the lighter only knows to get symbol B from A and through operating. The second concern about the brain simulation response. People's understanding of the process can be seen as um, or, uh, can be seen as a variety of a static state of synapses of the brain, the order of something. If it simulates the brain of Chinese people, then the agents must truly understand Chinese although it is essentially just a bunch of um, mechanical operations. To this rebuttal, so made two points in response. First, the strong AI has always maintained that the soul is to the brain is just like the hard software is to the hardware. The nature of software without, without a hardware platform is that it depends on the structure of its algorithm. But in this rebuttal, agent's understanding was completely dependent on its isomorphic structure with the human brain. Second, the principle of all computers can be seen as mechanical operations, such as a set of complex piping systems. So since that piping system receives the chance input and then gives chance output, but so think they do not understand Chinese. The pipeline system will never understand Chinese. 
The third class is about the combined response, a robust program based on the brain synaptic design. All senses and the transmissions are highly simulated from human flesh and nerves. Then the robot can be seen a complex system, compact system. Then it must have a completely perfect understanding ability. So admit that this robot has an understanding ability, but there's no help to support strong AI. According to the strong AI, accepting inputs and giving outputs that has passed the training test is a sufficient condition of claiming that the system has international intentionality, but this refute has limited a little bit too much. The fourth class is about other others men answering. You can only observe others from the outside, but not really go to the interior of them. How can you tell whether others have a comprehension or not? Why do you arbitrarily divide others from robots? So respond that, we are not discussing the problem that how do I know others have a comprehension where well, the robot has no understanding, but finds an update with the understanding and what characteristics we have attributed to it. He also asks one question that, that's passing the, that passing the train test have fully proved to the existence of understanding. Even if the train test is established, it can only be used to test, but not to design. To these rebuttals, so has given his own responses, and people still have heated debate about it. Well, in my opinion, I'm in favor of the chance room theory, because we all know that a person can have splendid tunes and expressions to express different meanings, even with some words. Mm, but I think um, an intelligent robot has a limitation in his tunes and expressions. For example, when a person asks the asks the question that are you happy with a normal tune and a fish expression, another with ironic tune and a fury expression, I think a human responder can easily distinguish the differences and give his own um, proper reactions. But I think it's too hard to a uh, robot. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. So you're introducing the notion of strong and weak AI that we haven't discussed in the class, but I would like to mention in the favor of time, save time, there are papers on the website on the Chinese yeah. room problem, and I think now that we've had an introduction, I'm, I hope that you're all motivated to actually go and read these papers, I think it's a very interesting debate and it's a very interesting thought experiment that actually Searle started. Okay, I think uh, maybe because time has advanced yes. so much, we should probably uh, stop here. And I would like to thank everyone uh, for participating. I would like to thank Pascal for his presentation and also once again, uh, Professor Dario Floriano from EPFL for his guest lecture. and. I would also like to thank all the students for their many contributions during this lecture. Okay, thank you very much. And see you all in two weeks' time on the 1st of November. So no class next week on the 25th of October, but in two weeks on the 1st of November. On the 25th, we start with the exercise number three. Okay. Okay, see you all again in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's right. <laughs> so is it just some uh, idea of how to? Yeah, sure.